Sunday night he had started with very high fevers and, and so on. And uh, the infection and double pneumonia. And um, that was Wednesday. They called us in on Wednesday. And they said, um, bring all of your children home. Um, and this is what's going on. So I was pushing the doctor. I said, if he were to get better, if he were to get better now, would that be headlines on the, on, on the six o'clock news? Like defying medical history, nothing like this ever happened. Is, is, where, where are we? Where are we in terms of this illness? Welcome, everybody. This is Ordinary People with Extraordinary Stories. I'm Chana Weisberg, host of this podcast. Joining me today is Vivi Darren, Mrs. Aviva Darren, who is the Shlucha in Stanford, Connecticut, and who has a very interesting story. Four of her children were born with Bloom syndrome, which she's going to tell us a little about, and they passed away. But what I've always been so enamored by Vivi is her perspective, her positivity, her uplifting way of talking, and her uplifting way of living. And I thought it would be phenomenal to have her here as a guest today to join us and share a little bit about her story and her unbelievable perspective of faith and joy. Welcome, Vivi. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Happy to be here. Okay. Okay. So first, could you tell us a little about Bloom syndrome, what it is, and what, how did it affected your children? So our second son, Mendel, was the first one um, to be born with Blooms. He was born in 1974. We did not have a diagnosis until he was three and a half in 1978. At that time, he was number 88 in the world to be diagnosed. Um, it's oh, wow. something... So it's a very... It's a pretty rare disease, well, um, I guess. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, it's characterized mainly at birth by small stature and failure to uh, to thrive is the heading they put it under. They just mm-hmm. the, the babies are typically four or five pounds. Don't, ga- don't gain um, typically as children do. Mm-hmm. And uh, we went for all different kinds of tests and so on. And finally, we got this diagnosis um, in 1978. He was three and a half. And since then, it's been, there's a lot of research that's done. It's not only among Ashkenazic Jews, but it is primarily. Um, one of the other uh, typical uh, problems that that come up with with blooms is um, upper respiratory um, high rate of upper respiratory infections and the theory at this point is that in the past before antibiotics um, children that were born with this unfortunately did not survive past early childhood because of the upper respiratory infections there's also a high rate of malignancy associated with, with blooms. Um, mm-hmm. what, an interesting side thing that we found out from one of the top geneticists who was actually the one to diagnose Mendel was that um, in the Jewish community, all, all Ashkenazic Jews are considered close cousins. So while blooms does mm. occur in other populations, then it's only if there's consanguinity, close, uh, close relatives. Um, but in the Jewish mm. community, for the purpose of genetics, this doctor said to us, all Jews are cousins. And I thought, okay, tell me something I don't know. Um, wow. Yeah, yeah. interesting. Yeah. So, 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 so how, how many children have, do you have? Uh, Viva. Viva. My name is actually Shifra Viva, Viva. with respect to my great grandmother for whom I am named the Shifra part, but that yeah. somehow doesn't, I'm but just we just Viva. call you Vivi. Okay. Okay. Um, so okay. Baruch Hashem, we are blessed with eight children, Ken and mm-hmm. the four who are with us in Elam Hazel, Arichas Yama Mishanim Tevis, they're Baruch Hashem, so four, four are in here this in this physical, physical world, world. Married with children and some with grandchildren. Baruch Hashem. We are very, very blessed and very, very grateful. And um, Mendel was the first. And then the next two 
did not uh, Baruch Hashem have the the syndrome. Our next child, our number five daughter, her her name she was named for my husband's grandmother, whose name was Bluma. Um, I did have somebody in the community ask me if we named her for Blooms, and I was like, no. Oh, no, no, <laughs> wow. Not, yeah, not no, at no. all. No. Not exactly. Right. And um, she was actually not as typical. I mean, in terms of the stature, she was a little bit bigger when she was born, and she didn't have uh, um, the upper respiratory stuff. Mendel had the upper respiratory stuff from, from early childhood. Blumi did not. And then our next child, Baruch Hashem, did not have, does not have, uh, have blooms. And the next two, Rifki and Shlemi, um, did. Shlemi was our youngest. He was, um, you know, he, he, we knew, actually, I wasn't even 100% sure at first. Now there are all kinds of blood tests that they do. Then they didn't have as many for carriers and markers and so on. But um, he he didn't appear to be, but then we found out that, yeah, he did have it. Um, he had, Baruch Hashem, a very healthy childhood until, uh, and he was the first one to have a diagnosis. He was four years old. He had a diagnosis of Wilms tumor, which is a pediatric um, kidney tumor. And he had surgery, he had chemo and, um, the and then a relapse and um, he had further treatment. The treatment showed complete. You know that the, the tumor, everything was was gone. Everything was clear. But at that point, he had developed um, myelodysplastic syndrome, which is a kind of like early leukemia, which could have been from the blooms or it could have been from the chemo. No way of knowing. Mm. Um, that diagnosis was two, two years after the original. So the first year was basically treatment. The second year was basically recovery from the treatment. And then the last few months, uh, the only thing to do for what he had was to have a, um, a bone marrow transplant, which he did undergo mm. in, in New York at Sloan. Um, and unfortunately that failed and he, he was six, six years old in a few months and he passed away in December of 96. The next mm -hmm. part of the story, and I'll just try and, you know, spare you too many sure. details over here, but just to, to, I, I always said that, especially with this part of the story, it's like bad fiction. No editor would buy this cause it just doesn't happen like this in, <laughs> in life. But, um, it's a real life yeah. could be harder than what you can imagine, yeah, bad right? bad fiction. Um, six months later, Blumi, who was 15 and a half, um, we had noticed that she was losing weight. We had noticed that she was very down. Um, and she was very, very attached to Shlemy. And we, you know, just didn't even think in terms of anything physical because uh, the grief and the depression from it just seemed so... Of course. Unfortunately, she was diagnosed with uh, liver cancer in, with, at 15 and a half. And um, mm. she had a pretty rough half a year trying different treatments. She was on lists for trans, transplant of the liver. Um, and she passed away on Friday night of Hanukkah, the fourth night of Hanukkah. She was born on a Friday night. It's actually one of the things about her her life that how it was framed by Shabbos candles because I was in labor with her Friday afternoon and I was fighting for permission to bench lift in the waiting room. They wow. couldn't to, to light Shabbos, to candles, light Shabbos right. candles in the in the waiting room, and I they wanted to do some kind of a procedure that I didn't want. I said, okay, I'll compromise if you let me. Um, Go light candles. Light I'll candles. let you. I'll let oh, you. Wow. I wanted to put in a, a, a put in a line for intravenous for me. Anyway, so right. they got their way. I got my way, and I was able to light candles that Friday night. And light Blumi candles. was born um, maybe two hours later. And mm. when she wow. passed away, um, she had been in and out of the hospital. At that point, she was not in the hospital. And she lit Shabbos candles. It was one of the last things that she 
consciously did. And and my husband, um, my husband lit Hanukkah candles and then she lit Shabbos candles. I always get mixed up with the mm-hmm. order, but whatever it was, he did it in the mm-hmm. right order. Mm-hmm. Um, right. Uh, yeah. First, yeah. And then, and she lit Shabbos candles. So that, that was actually the last mitzvah that she actually physically did in the world. And a few hours later, we were back in the hospital and she passed away that night. So she, she was born on Shabbos and passed oh, away wow. on Shabbos. But, um, Wow. So that that was wow. yeah, that was blummy. So, so I, I'm sure people are thinking. Well, first of all, how how did you react when you heard that you were carrying this? That your children had a chance of having blooms. So how did you react when you were they were diagnosed with blooms? Um, it was kind of uh, because there weren't tests at the time that we got married. It was not an identified. Um, syndrome. So there weren't tests mm-hmm. for it. There was no Darya Sharm, the Jewish genetic uh, testing center that um, helps couple determine if they're uh, genetically compatible. There, that had not been started right. yet. And there were no tests for this, even when it was started. Now it's a regular part of the panel that the G- uh, Jewish mm-hmm. genetics uh, test for. But then it wasn't even mm-hmm. a known thing. So I have a weakness that I tend to find whatever possible way I can blame myself for something. I'm always going to find it. It's something that I've been, I've been right. working on that for many years, but it is a tendency that I have. But in this case, you know, Jewish mother's guilt, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. In this case, you know, there was nothing that I could have done differently. There was nothing that I um, would have known to do differently. And, when we had asked the Rebbe for a bracha, uh, we asked the Rebbe for his blessing before we got engaged. The Rebbe used a very strong expression that has always been a source of strength for me. And he said, Nachan hashidach, this match is correct. V'tev, and it's good. Yehei b'shatev matzlachas, it should be in a, um, in, in a good hour, in a successful hour. In other words, at the time, everything about it should lead to good things. And mm-hmm. I asked her Hatsian that he will daven for us at um, the previous Rebbe's resting place. So those words that the Shidduch is correct and that it's good. So obviously we, we all we want to see in, in an expression that the Rebbe used, it's one of my favorite expressions, Tov Hanira Vanikla, good that is revealed and obvious. So to say that something is good, it can be good on a spiritual level. It doesn't mean that I'm going to perceive it as good. Um, but obviously, that is what we hope for. And that is the natural assumption that a, per- a person should have. That's part of our trust in God, is that things will be good. Not that they're good as he sees it. That That's a no-brainer. That There's nothing to discuss, of course. When we say good, I mean, we're talking about how I perceive it, how I feel it, how it shows up in my life as a person, the person who I am. As something sweet, yeah. as a blessing, as something yeah. that we like, yeah. as something that we appreciate. Sure. Exactly. And, um, and, you know, Baruch Hashem, again, I can't stress it enough that I am very, very conscious and try to be ever more conscious of how much that is actually factually uh, you know, real and present in my life as good revealed blessings. But there's no question that when we're talking about what these children went through, um, it, it did not show up that way. So much about their right. life did, but this right. aspect but, did not. The fact that they went through the, you know, the, the, the challenges that the medical, they faced, sure. and, and just even before the medical, but the challenges that they had because of, their situation, and then the medical things, and then obviously the fact that they that they passed away young. Um, so I had to find a different handle that would give me more access to good. Mm. And part of that was not across the board, but just something as a, a to keep in mind. What good can I extract from the situation? What can what especially after they passed away? 
Mm-hmm. You know, it's, while they were alive, there was always the question of what more can I do to support them, to help them, to make things better for them. But right. after they passed away, then it's like so. So now, where do I where do I get good from here? And and um, so where where did you find that good? How did you find that comfort? What comforts you? So it, it's an ongoing process. It's an ongoing process, and um, the timing was also very interesting. Schleimi was the first one to be diagnosed. They, the, they had the diagnosis of the syndrome, but it didn't really have any practical implications. Blumi and Schleimi were fine. Mendel always had upper respiratory stuff, and, and Rifki did. And they were the ones, Mendel passed away at the age of 36, Rifki was 29 and married. Mendel was also married. But they were the ones that had the upper respiratory challenges. And I had a doctor tell me once with Rifki before uh, things got really serious with her, he said, I'm just going to give you this, a doctor at Yale, I'm just going to give you this medicine. You give it to her when you think she needs it because I can't figure her out. I don't, wow. I don't know what's going on. I can't figure it out. But you seem to have your finger on the pulse of it. So when you think she needs the medicine, and that worked for us actually for quite a, quite a number of years. But um, basically, our family life rocked along very smoothly. And the typical ups and downs and teenagers, et cetera, et cetera. But Baruch Hashem, it was um, nothing really out of the ordinary until Shlemy's diagnosis, which was the first time that it... Shlemy was diagnosed in August of 1994, which was about six weeks after Gimel Tammuz, mm-hmm. six weeks after the Rebbe's passing. And for two and a half years before that, the Rebbe was not well. Mm-hmm. And in our lives, in trying to spread not just the Rebbe's message, really what I would say, the Rebbe's lens, the way the Rebbe guided us in how to look at the world. And that was something that started right at the beginning, at the beginning of his leadership. In, and it's been taught. Which is what? What would be the lens that you would say that you look at the world with? I wish I could say I look at the world with. I would love to. Or I that you try, try to. Right. I'm, I'm, it's an ongoing thing. But I believe that the lens that the Rebbe is guiding us to is to see the world the way it's supposed to be. Which is? When we say Mashiach, for me, um, another word that I like to use for that, Normal. A no- normal. normal, a normal world, uh-huh. not a world that seems so abnormal right. and so crazy. In other words, happy, healthy, healthy physically, people healthy physically, healthy spiritually, healthy in relationships, happy, healthy, whole families. Right. When we say peace and the, the big piece of peace, it's all of these micro. Micro Aspects, worlds that are sure. that, are, that come together and, and uh, everything's aligned, everything works, right. everything is as it's supposed to be. So, what do you do when it doesn't feel that way? I mean, I'm sure it did not feel that way when your children are sick or you're taking them for chemo or taking them to the hospital. What do you do when you're not feeling that the world is aligned, that you're not seeing a normal? It's not normal for children to die so young. What do you do when you're seeing that? So, years ago. I figured out that one of my favorite books that my my go-to is Drebbe's Calendar for Every Day, that one, mm-hmm. which was one of the first books that um, that was published by for that Drebbe had made, which is um, Hayom Yom. Today is the day. What and his father-in-law, who was then Rebbe, it was that when our Rebbe was Rebbe. It was before that, 1940, 42, 43. Um, a teaching for every single day. And this was written in the middle of World War II and the flames were raging in Europe and in other places. And the question that the Rebbe has opened up the book with is, what have I done and what am I doing 
to lighten the birth pangs of the arrival of Mashiach, who's coming imminently. And I believe that um, it came very much to the forefront. I mean, it was a thread running all through the years of the Rebbe's leadership, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s. And then in 1991, the Rebbe said it in a very dramatic way, but I don't think it was a departure from what he was saying all along which on the first night that he accepted to be Rebbe, he said, you've got to do the work. Mm -hmm. I'm not, you know, anything, I think this is the understatement of history when the Rebbe said, if there's something that I can help you with, I'll help you. Mm -hmm. You know, in the Yiddish, it's like we, if something that we can help you with, we'll help you. And and look how generous the Rebbe's help, you know. Mm -hmm. but, but this idea that you're in this, You've got skin in the game. You're the ones that have to make it happen. And working with the Rebbe's guidance, it's very, very clear that the Rebbe's hand is moving all of it. Mm -hmm. And that's how we see the direction that Hashem wants this world to be. But we have to kind of like with Moshe Rabbeinu raising the Mishkan, you know, the, everybody tried and it's heavy, heavy, heavy. And it kind of, he he puts his hand there and, and the walls come up. We We have to... We have to do our part. Then, and the Abish, the Rebbe, God, the Rebbe, whoever t- takes care of making sure that it happens. But there's no, it's indispensable that we have to do our part. So, uh, in a nutshell, I think somebody summed up this idea that it's not, we don't ask Lama, why, but just change the voweling on that so that it reads Lima, for what? What am I meant to do here? And we always have agency. There is always something we can do. So it's not a question of trying to be, you know, holy and all that. That's not my speed. But I, I, I don't like to waste my um, mental energy either. Mm-hmm. And when it comes to the question of why things happen, there's too much data that we don't have. Mm-hmm. There's too much I to believe it. I can sign on to that the Abishta has a plan and that the plan is perfect and that someday we'll know what that plan is and how everything fits into place. But the Rebbe said once, there's a, the prophecy in Isaiah, Hashem ki be. I will thank you, Hashem, that you were angry with me. Which mm-hmm. interestingly, um, when a number of years ago, we were in Yad Vashem and they had the actual Aron Kodesh, the Ark, that was in the children's shul in Theresienstadt, in one of the camps, the one that was the showcase camp. And across the top of that Aron Kodesh, it says this pasuk, this verse, mm-hmm. ki to be. I will thank you, Hashem, that you were angry with me. And the Rebbe said about that pasuk, now is not the time. We don't thank him for that now. Mm-hmm. when everything is clear and everything is fixed and everything is whole and everything is beautiful and happy and we look back, uh, oh, that's what it was. Wow. There's no wow now. For so that. if there's no wow now and for there's that. the tears now yeah. for that, right, of course. And we are feeling the rejection and we're feeling, I mean, the despair sometimes. I'm sure you felt despair. You felt like it was so hard. It was so challenging. How did you cope? How did you cope with that? Okay. Um, I think the fact that we started this journey, that it started with our youngest, we have at the time, uh, you, know, a, a, you know, seven other children, the oldest of whom was in his early 20s. Uh, the others were mostly in their teens and um, we, we had to we had to so you didn't know that your other children had this 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 syndrome no I knew that they you're... had it I, I mean he was diagnosed with the, right. with the malignancy when right. he had the, the right. cancer right 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 and um, I think that the there are certain ideas that have very good currency now and it's a wonderful thing and i think we need to be linking them more um gratitude is very much a 
you know, it's it's common knowledge. Everybody, there's all kinds of journals and books, and, and it's beautiful. It's great. It's wonderful. So I would say two things with it. One is gratitude go, needs to go someplace. You know, we have Thanksgiving Day in America. Thanksgiving mm -hmm. too. You, I give thanks to, not the universe. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that 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 idea of developing and it's something it, it's not a question of you call yourself religious you spiritual it has nothing to do with any of those things it is the idea that each person has to have their own personal relationship with god mm -hmm. and community is great and family is wonderful and all kinds of things everybody comes into this world alone and there's that part of us that has to always be nurtured because we need to always know that we're not alone. We're not alone. And when we cultivate gratitude and our connection to Hashem, a woman in one of my classes the other day said, because um, we had been talking about this idea, and she said, this might be very silly, but I, I just want to know what you think. I was driving and I had a close call with, I don't remember the details, but, and, and when, but something, you know, on the road, she said, and it was a very close call. And afterwards I said, oh, thank you, God. Was I being silly? And I was like, no, that's exactly right. Of course, that you said exactly the right thing. So when we're more and more cognizant of that, then our given is Hashem is holding me. Hashem mm -hmm. loves me. Hashem cares for me. Hashem has a plan that's perfect for me. Wow. So if did you ever feel like he doesn't have that? Of course, we're human beings. Of course, and sometimes the image that would come to mind for me is like, you know, imagine a little a little girl and she's very very upset about something or other that her her father did. Her father is holding her in his arms and she's very upset and she's you know, crying and, and screaming and she's pounding on his chest with her little fists and she feels very safe and secure while she's mm. pounding on his chest with her fists. Wow, wow. And sometimes, wow. you know, that, that inner child, yeah, that, that's, that's very legitimate. Um, in, a, in a broader sense, maybe that ever spoke about the idea that the very fact that somebody can be questioning God or even angry, or, and so on. That itself is an expression of belief. It's an expression right. of trust. Otherwise, who are you talking to? Why are you angry? Why are you angry? Right. What, do you, what did you expect? It just happened, tough luck. God forbid. But, right. but we, can't, we can't come at that in a moment. That's, and that's what I, where I, uh, one of the biggest blessings of my life, of that... Um, you know, tongue in cheek, I always used to like to say uh, one of the most brilliant choices I ever made was the parents that I picked. You know, mm -hmm. that I was, I, <laughs> my, my parents were Rabbi Zalman and Rissi Posner. I grew up in Nashville, Tennessee. They were Shluchim who were sent by the previous Rebbe, and then the Rebbe wanted them to continue there. And um, so, so many gifts that they gave us. Um, one of them was they never, ever apologized to us for the challenges of our life. I didn't think anything of it, the fact that I didn't know any Shoma Shabbos kids, there were no kids like me. I, I didn't feel that way growing up. I had friends, and I, I knew that. You mean there were no observant children no anywhere observant near you? No observant children, right. They no were all, you were all growing up right. in, in a very was, different society. Right, and and. They, you know, we cherished the times that we were with family. Everybody wants to be with family, but they were they were very happy in their lives. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't. The only one whisper of difficulty that I felt from them was when it came came time that they had to send us away to school. That was mm -hmm. hard. That was hard. Sure. But okay, you know, right. some things in life can be. But the fact that. Um, I don't know if it's call it resilience or what that um, their their outlook about being happy with life and they had plenty of challenges. So I think 
you, you, I, there was a quote from you that said, you play a mind game, act and feel as if the outcome would be an open miracle. Yeah. Okay. So um, when, when Shlemy was diagnosed, my husband was actually out of the country and um, he was complaining. Shlemy was on a Monday morning. He was complaining about pain. It hurts when I breathe. So I took him to the pediatrician and she sent us to um, the only, at the time, the only pediatric oncologist in, hematologist oncologist in Connecticut. And um, I remember always being so grateful for the word hematology. You know, not, not oncologists, we know what oncologists are, but you know what, hematology, blood, it could be, you know, could be anything. And uh, I took him and she said, he has very enlarged spleen. And so for the next, you know, I'm sending you for a, an ultrasound. So I thought, okay, an enlarged spleen. You know, people can deal with enlarged spleens. And she said, nothing too clear about what else it could be. Um, and one of the things that hit me when we went for that first ultrasound, and by the next day he was in surgery, that nothing is a fact until it's a fact. So if I would start going to the what ifs, I, no, mm -hmm. I don't have to go there. Mm -hmm. I don't have to accept it. This is not, I'm not in denial, but a possibility is also not a reality. And I don't have to accept a possibility as a reality if it's not a positive thing. Mm -hmm. So that's a little bit of a, call it a mind game. I think that's really the Are way. Are you naturally an optimist? Are you naturally not a worrier? Because some of us like just go with that direction, you know, with it, thinking about the worst possible right. outcome. Right. So I am, uh, you know, my name is Vivi and I'm a recovering worrier. <laughs> <laughs> wow. You know, like by nature, for sure. For sure. Right. But, and I think over the years and with my experiences, there, there are some things that I tend to worry about more than is healthy or typical. And it depends. Sometimes I try to make sure that I get allowances. Sometimes I try to get more help for it. Um, but it, and to the extent that I am able, I try to strengthen the muscles around that wounded muscle that, so that it can compensate and strengthening the gratitude thing that it's, it's, it's an ongoing thing because it reminds you um, a few my, our, our daughter and her family, they're shluchen on college campus. And uh, it's one of those campuses that's very, um, has a lot of challenges for Jewish students. And so they've had their busiest semester in over 20 years. Wow. So the first week after October 7th, um, she started posting uh, different prayers to say and other different things. But she was talking to her five and a half year old and her three year old. And she said to them, so I'm going to post something to Davin. What, what, what davening do you think I should post? What prayers do you think I should post for people to say today? And her five and a half year old said, I don't know them. So she said, why that one? So the five and a half year old said, because that reminds us that Hashem is always with us. Mm. And when I was saying before about, you know, the gratitude that I have, that I was planted in this world in a place where it's natural to, to have that kind of relationship. It's a natural thing. Everybody has to come to things on their own. Everybody has to struggle. Everybody has to make it their own. It's not like, you know, when people think that you're programmed, oh, you're the, you know, the rabbi's children. We used to joke in Nashville that it's like, you know, that people think, oh, the, the rabbi's kids, you know, we're the rabbi's kids. And we sit around and we talk about God right. in, quiet, in quiet tones right. in Hebrew. <laughs> Right, of course. <laughs> so you know, there's 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 that image, and people don't realize how much you know, how much work goes into you know. Maybe you can see it in a five year old and say, "Wow, that's some mother and some father there." Twenty five year old, if they're still saying the same thing, you don't know what happened in between. You know, every right. person till they get to even if that twenty five, they're saying the same thing, they have to go through a process of claiming it for their own. 
But there's still, there's no getting away from the fact that it's one of the biggest gifts to come into the world with is, is a family and an environment that um, brings out for you how Hashem is positive, loving, caring, and with you. And then there's mm-hmm. there, even in the hard places that I'm not alone there either. And that, you know, the, the prayer that make it good for me so that I can see that it's good, we're supposed to do that. It's a mitzvah to guess God for the things that we need. He knows what we need. He knows better than we do. So mm-hmm. why is it a mitzvah? I think, I think a big piece of the mitzvah is that we need to remember where it's coming from. Mm-hmm. I know, I know when you, when your daughter blew me, when she was 15 years old, she became sick from liver, liver cancer, and she was going through chemo treatments. And you describe how she had beautiful red hair and you, you were like wondering how you would handle her grief when she was losing it. Can you tell us a little about that? So she was being given a, it wasn't a typical treatment and it was targeted directly to the liver. And I asked the doctor, and actually this is a very typical thing that with all of the things that you're thinking about of what's going to happen with this or that. But when in the case, especially of uh, girls and women, the concern about hair. And I asked the doctor about it and he said, uh, well, this medicine and they weren't calling it for some reason. It wasn't directly chemo, but it was. Um, this medicine is not supposed to cause hair loss. I thought, okay, not supposed to. We know, you know what that can be. Um, it was an interesting thing with the doctors, not, not the one who treated her, but the one who diagnosed her, who had been Schlemy's doctor. And she was very, he was four years old. He was not yet four. And she was very strong in her belief that a a patient needs to be on board with what's going on. And if she wasn't going to be happy with what we were telling him about what was happening in his body, that she was going to have to take matters into her own hands. I mean, this was, you know, 30 something years, Mm -hmm. 30 years ago. I don't know what they could say now, but whatever. Um, anyway, she was happy with how we were handling it, but we had to run it past her how we were explaining what was happening in his body. We had had several encounters with doctors that were not so pleasant in the presence of Schleimi. Actually, Blimmy was there then also. So I had given my kids the understanding that the terror tells us that Permission is given to a doctor to heal. The Rebbe mm-hmm. taught us this. That's what the Gemara says. But the Rebbe explained that he said, to heal, to heal. They're not prophets. And they're not, they're, they have nothing to say about anything other than healing. We're not mm-hmm. asking them in terms of a prognosis, as I explained to a very, very good doctor who later told people that Darren's made me a better doctor. Mm-hmm. I said, the only question about prognosis is if you're talking about should we do this medicine or this medicine, the statistics and so on, mm-hmm. this mm-hmm. one works 99% of the time and this one works 2% of the time. So then you need to know something about the numbers. But I'm not asking you for, for predictions about what's going to be. And it was he accepted it and it was a good thing because – although we didn't get the outcome that we wanted, but Shlemy defied all of the predictions. And some of them were made in his face, which still you can see, you know, I I still can't handle it that a doctor could be so insensitive. So our kids had heard from us, you know, that sometimes when a doctor knows their role to heal, then, you know, and oh, another thing that they pointed out was that the Torah is recognizing the expertise of doctors doesn't say that any person can just come along and decide what they're going to do, but we'll see. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. there's a recognition of the expertise, but they have to know their limits. They are doctors. They're not prophets. And we had been very open with our children about sometimes doctors overstep their bounds and all the jokes about, you know, that's, that that's God. He thinks he's a doctor, you know, that, um, so they, they knew how we felt about that. So when we were 
when Blumi was hospitalized and had not yet gotten the full diagnosis of, of where she was at, the doctor who was so insistent that she had to, if I didn't tell it to Shlemy Wright, she was going to have to step in and do it. I was talking to her in the hall and she said, I have nothing to say about what should be done in terms of to tell her or not. I will do whatever you say. Hmm. I will, I will follow your lead. You want me to talk? I'll talk. You don't want me to, I will follow your lead. So I appreciated that. And I said, I'll get back to you. And I said mm-hmm. to Bloomy, I said, you know how it is with doctors. Sometimes they are, you can see that they're God's messengers and they're saying and doing the right things. And sometimes they speak foolishness and they say mm-hmm. things that they shouldn't. And it's up to you. If you want the doctors to come in and talk to you, you could and we'll do that. Or if you want me to talk to them and Tati to talk to them, you know, your father will t- to talk to them in the hall, we'll do that. And then we'll come back and tell you, and you can ask us anything you want. So were you, were you honest with your children about the chances of their survival? Chances? We don't deal They're... with chances. So what, what would you tell them? Well, first, Blumi chose that we should tell. We should talk should to the doctors right. and we should come in and talk to her. Right, right. She would ask me sometimes, is what I have serious? Mm-hmm. I would say, yeah. I said, but you know, a cold could be serious. A cold mm-hmm. sometimes, it should never happen to anybody, but it's happened that a cold can what seems to be a, a light pneumonia or a light bronchitis or, you know, whatever it is. And she had seen enough bronchitis and pneumonias in the house to know, but something that's a very mild thing can sometimes become very, 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 very serious mm-hmm. and, and life-threatening. And on the other hand, there are people who have been in very life-threatening situations where doctors didn't think anything could possibly save them and, and they survived. Mm-hmm. So, you know, is, is it possible to get better from where you are? Absolutely it's possible. Mm-hmm. It's in the Abishter's hands. Mm-hmm. And we all are in the Abishter's hands every minute of every day. Right. I'm just wondering if some of the listeners are thinking that that's denial. You're denying what's what am I inevitable. Denying? It's not inevitable. In- right. It was not right. inevitable. Did you prepare your children? Like, was that, were you giving them enough preparation for what, what they were going through? You know, I I, probably would be better if you have my children sitting here to tell you, and I'm not sure that I want to hear hear everything that they have to say about that. But um, our children were present. Our children were at Shlemy's bedside. The last week of his life was a very, very challenging, very difficult week. And the last few days, he had to be medically sedated. He was in terrible pain at that point. Um, But even then, the doctors called us in on Wednesday. Sunday night, he had started with very high fevers and and so on. And uh, the infection and double pneumonia. And um, that was Wednesday. They called us in on Wednesday. And they said, um, bring all of your children home. Um, and this is what's going on. So I was pushing the doctor. I said, if he were to get better, if he were to get better now, would that be headlines on the, on, on the six o'clock news? Like defying medical history, nothing like mm-hmm. this ever happened. Is, is, where, where are we? Where are we in terms of this illness? So he said, no, but look, he has pneumonia in both lungs and he has a massive infection in his whole body. And both of those things would have to clear. He was on 24 lines of medication coming into his body at that point. Uh, Not not 24. They were joined at some places. It wasn't 24 points of entry, but there were 24 lines of medication. He said, it wouldn't be medical history, but both lungs would have to clear. And 
the infection would have to clear, and we don't see that happening. Hmm. So I said, okay, what you just told me is that it's possible. Hmm. It's possible yeah. in the realm of nature, as you call it. Right. It's, you can see a possibility of how he could recover from this. So I am going to call my children home because Shlemy feels better when they're around. And mm -hmm. anything that will make him feel better, he should have. That's why mm -hmm. I'm calling them home. Now, I, and I walked out. The, the meeting was, I mean, he, the meeting was finished right. before that. I had nothing more to stay for. Um, I don't think he was very impressed. But, <laughs> right. okay, wow. the kids came home. This was Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And just, they were... Um, you know, we, we tried to make sure that the room itself, there were different things that the, the boys were studying, the girls bringing in. The room should be a happy place. And never said to anybody, don't cry or anything like that. Not at all. Mm -hmm. And if people had to let things go, you know, but, but not in the room. This room has to be a happy place. Mm. And Friday night... Two, two and a half days after that discussion, the doctors came in and they said, we have to tell you something. We waited for 48 hours to see that this was real. But we want to tell you that both lungs cleared. Wow. And the infection he has negative cultures for over 48 hours. Wow. So what on Wednesday morning he said was the most unlikely, it's, it's possible, but so unlikely. And I said, okay, that's where I'm putting my, that's, I'm, wow. I'm, 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 I'm holding I'm, on to that. Right. Yeah. I'm going to live on this hill, not the other way. And that was the first time that um, my husband, that whole week, that my husband and I were out of the room at the same time. There was always either one of us. I mean, there was always somebody with him, of the kids or other mm -hmm. relatives. My parents were there. My mother-in-law had, had come. But that was the first time that the two of us went out to the parents' room together to have a little bit of a Shabbos meal. And life looked good. Sunday morning, things started to go downhill. Mm. And his kidneys started to fail. And the kids were, can we do dialysis? Can we do this? Can we do that? And, and we had to explain to them that we couldn't and that there was, there was anything that could be done was done. And there was, there was nothing more that we could do. And um, I, I don't know how much you want me to go into the details of it, but our children were there and they were around Shlini's bedside. They were singing a whole Shabbos. They were singing Matzai Shabbos. Mm -hmm. We were there and he passed away that night, Matzai Shabbos, about I think 3.40 in the morning or 2.40. Mm -hmm. wow. I don't remember exactly. But the children were there and they were, they were part of that. At the time, I thought, I know myself and I know that um, you know, besides having the weakness of shoulda, woulda, coulda, if I woulda this and woulda that, you know, I'll always be able to find something. But besides that, I was afraid, how am I going to process the fact that on Wednesday, the doctor said it was so far-fetched that he didn't even consider it he didn't even tell me until I, I forced it out of him. And he was a firm doctor. He was an observant doctor. He was a believer. So it wasn't like this was a, a strange concept yet. So to hear that on Friday night, that this totally unexpected miracle was unfolding, and then uh, just over 24 hours later, right. I was very, very grateful and I'm still very grateful that I did not process it as a tease. And this is 27 years ago, and I mm. still don't process it as a tease. Mm. What I, the, the lens that I chose was that Hashem was saying, I could do this, but mm. for reasons that I can't give you, mm -hmm. 
it's not happening now. Mm -hmm. But I took it as a sign of Hashem's care and that Hashem, Hashem's presence. And, um, you know, one of the, okay, I, 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 I will go for it. The nigan that they were singing, the song, the, the, the melody that they were, that we were singing at the time that he passed away was the Rebbe's father's hakafas nigan. Simchas Torah, a Simchas Torah nigan. It's interesting to think about Simchas Torah, the connotations. And Shlemi passed away on the 12th of Tevis, which mm -hmm. is a, a two weeks after Hanukkah, not even. Mm -hmm. Ten days after Hanukkah. And what does Simchas Torah come in over here? And here we had just been singing the Simchas Torah melody. And it's a description how um, there was a custom that when a Rebbe was picked to be Rebbe. I don't think it carried over to this generation. I don't know. But the custom used to be that um, the Rebbe would be made like an honorary officer of the Chavra Kadisha. Mm -hmm. And that on Simchas Torah, they would accompany him um, like a whole procession from his house to the shul, holding candles, everybody holding candles and singing. And that when this was done for the fifth Rebbe, for the previous Rebbe's father, the Rebbe Rashab, Rebbe Shalom Deifber, he said a mimer, a Hasidic discourse, a teaching on the, um, I'm, I'm, it's escaping me what the source is, if it's in Medrash or in, in one of the good books. Ein HaKadosh Baruch Hu that God does not come to his creatures with a demand that is, it's usually translated as too heavy for them to bear, but it's not that. A trinya is more like a, a, negative, a negative package. Mm -hmm. um, I want to come back to that afterwards because I think it's very often misused. But mm -hmm. that, but that was in the in the teaching the, in the Hayyim mm -hmm. Yayim, in the calendar teaching for that day. So it quotes this, and he 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 spoke on this topic, and he said, "Now, th this is a time. I, I should have it open in front of me. This is a time when the Balei Seicho, the people, the intellects, the." people who try to understand everything and so on, they have to put aside the intellectual pursuit right now and do what has to be done for the good of the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. March forward. There, is some, there are times six months later when Bloomy was diagnosed and uh, our kids were all at the hospital and they were waiting for us in the waiting room and, and, Walking, I several times I had this experience of I understand why they put um, bars on the walls of hospital corridors because how else would people walk there? Like you need something to hold Strength. you up, right? And um, I came into the room and I just said the first thing that came to my head: Okay, everybody, we're shutting off our brains right now. The only thing to mm -hmm. think about is what can we do for Bloomy? Wow, and. And and that was the focus. How do we mm -hmm. how do we support her? How I want to just can, yeah. Can I ask you a personal question? Go right ahead. <laughs> Did you ever think of not having more children when you saw that your your children were having Bloom's syndrome? Of course, it was even suggested to us by dear friends. Mentors. And there was a whole process involved. I could not bear the thought of saying no to Hashem's brach. Hmm. The thought that I would say, you know, like, I'm done. You know, I, I don't want any more. I, I couldn't bear it. For one thing, I hoped that I would have more healthy children, and I did. Mm -hmm. 
I didn't want to say, I didn't want to say no to anything that Davidson wanted to give me. I, I, mm -hmm. I could not come to I, make peace with that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I was before this interview, I was thinking about different specific things because I, my, these children, the ones in Ghanaian, they continue to be a very active presence in our lives. And the life lessons that I learned from them are very meaningful um, in every aspect of life. Um, and, and they also, I mean, I know Rifki said, I have an incredible life, even though she had right. undergone a double lung transplant at that point. Yeah. So it seems like it wasn't just you who had that attitude, but your children. So I was going to say, if you, that. if you want yeah. to see really what it means to take that, um, that idea, you know, where does that go? Google Rifki Darren or Rifki Darren Berman on YouTube and there are about four or five videos of her. And one of them is she's saying, you know, and at that point she doesn't look good. She had, she's wearing a very tight kerchief and her face is very gaunt. She actually fought and beat cancer in the middle of the whole lung transplant thing. It may have been because of the medication, whatever it was she had it. She was very proud of the fact that, you know, the others did not beat it, but she beat that. And so she looks terrible, and and um, and nevertheless, I'm 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 saying that. I mean, she was a beautiful girl, but at that point, and physically, she was so low. And that was where she was saying, um, so, you know, I had um, just my own sister-in-law. Now, my daughters-in-law all say, "It wasn't me. It wasn't you? No, it wasn't me. It was nobody owns up to being the one who asked her this." But she said, I "Had to ask me." Um, you know, would I want to have a child like me? You know, if I, because I know I can't have a lot of children, but, you know, one, but have a child like me. And you know what that's saying? That's saying that my life isn't worth anything. Like, you know, it, I, I can't, I'm not quoting her exactly. It, it just, yeah. I, I, to this day, I meet perfect strangers. If you don't know what your daughter Rifki means in my life. It's okay. Right. I can imagine because I know what she is in my life. And there was one point where she said to me, I can't, I just can't anymore. Which actually happened more than once when she had. And I thought, what do I tell her? Me standing here in, you know, and I'm going to tell her how she should be coping with, with, if I put myself in their shoes, any of them, but especially Risky and, and Mendel, put them, put myself in, in their shoes for five minutes. You, you could, I, you could lose your mind just trying to think how how they cope. So I can't tell her. The only thing I could come up with was, Rifki, you've been in a situation like this before, mm -hmm. and somehow you managed to dig deep and come up with what you needed. I don't know how you did it. I just know that you've done it. Mm -hmm. She didn't right. say anything. She didn't say anything, but, and she, <laughs> Hashem, she did. And it's another thing that along the road, although we didn't get the outcomes that we wanted, we had many, many, many miracles, not just mm -hmm. good, bright spots, but we, we had, we saw that, we saw that, um, you know, so that the idea that, I guess I mean, that's, that's the only answer I can give you. Right. Wow. What What would you tell somebody who's going through a hardship now? How to get through it? So it's interesting. You know, I you're you're from Toronto, and so much of our speaking journey on this uh, our speaking journey actually started in Toronto. In uh, it was March of 1998. So. Wow. Shlemy passed away at the end of 96, Blumi at the end of 97. And this is a few months later, we were invited to Toronto. And I think the topic was something like bridge over troubled waters, faith and joy in the face of challenge and adversity. Like, okay, whoa. Mm -hmm. um, and something that hit me then, and that's why I'm always so grateful for these opportunities to, to speak about this topic, because it makes me dig deep and come up with more and 
this was the first time and it hit me then and I still feel this way that our story and all of these things that I'm sharing and, and more, it's not, God forbid, a manual for tragedy. Mm. But rather flip it around. If we're talking about a way of life and it's a constant process, it's constant and we have to be so careful not to judge ourselves not to get caught up in all of the shame and the guilt and the, all of that stuff. And that's a, another very, you know, a lot of crazy things about the world in 2024. But one wonderful thing is that the vocabulary for understanding our inner work mm -hmm. and how, how that vocabulary enables me for sure to understand the teachings of Hasidus in a way that I never could before. If it can even help us in this, in our situation, how much more can this way of thinking, this way of living, help people over the ordinary speed bumps in the road of life? It's not, God forbid, a manual for tragedy. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, the things that we talked about at the beginning about gratitude and cultivating your relationship with God, your personal relationship. And I think they're, they're very practical things with that because. Can you, I mean, wait, wait, I know time is running away and I know you have to go. Can you just end with like, what would, how would a person cultivate their personal relationship with God? Okay. Okay. So if they don't feel it, if they don't feel that connection, if they don't feel that God, I mean, you described God holding you, okay. you know, and, and carrying you. What if we don't feel that way? Right. So generally speaking, this is the posture of our generation. Finger on the pulse. How do I feel? How do I feel? How do I feel? You don't always have to keep your finger on your pulse. Mm -hmm. And the, the question, and we can feel all kinds of things, and we don't have to get upset with, it, with anything that we're feeling. It doesn't, it's okay. The, where we, where we, we take action, say cultivate the relationship, talk to him, and let him talk to you. Mm -hmm. So talking to God in your words, what's on your heart, in your situation, wherever you are, 100%. But the words of, our, of davening, the words that prayer. Jews, uh, yes, the words of prayer that Jews have been saying for thousands of years carry a lot of value, a lot of weight. One of the, um, among the incredible stories that we've been hearing since October 7th is of, from many of the survivors, from those who were, thank God, able to get out from the music festival and those who were able to escape from the Gaza envelope, from the Kibbutzim and, and so on. People saying that they found themselves saying the words of Shema Yisrael mm -hmm. and they didn't know they knew them. Mm -hmm. They were right. not religious. They were not in the habit of prayer. They didn't realize. But, you know, living in Israel, you absorb something. And, right. and, and the people who had no idea, because knowing... This is a matter of belief, and um, an Israeli um, member of Knesset, probably about 60 years ago, interviewed the Rebbe, a woman, and she wrote about it afterwards, and she said, one of the things about encountering a believer is that it's not just that they believe in God, but that they believe in you. And, mm -hmm. you know, in what we say in Madani, that God believes in us, you know, that that so that you carry the ability, you carry this piece of God in you. I don't feel it, but I, you know, okay, but God says he does. That's, mm -hmm. that's what I'm being taught. You always sign on to anything Judaism teaches, even if it's not something that I'm yet comfortable. But the thing that goes with that, besides saying the words in the Siddur, like the Modi'ani is, you could talk about Modi'ani for six hours mm -hmm. or more the morning prayer, the first words that we say before we get out of bed, they're so powerful. And your whole day is different. But studying Torah, you have to furnish your brain. Mm -hmm. You have to furnish your brain. And the more you have what's 
material to think about. And, and, and it's not just, it's not talking yourself into some kind of a trance. We're very practical. Mm-hmm. Our feet are on the ground. We know very well what's around us. We're not in denial. We're not no. repressing. No, you're no. not repressing your emotions or your feelings. You're not really at in all. tune with that. Mm-hmm. But I, I have the ability to choose. Mm-hmm. I have the ability to choose which emotions I want to play out, which emotions mm-hmm. I need to work with. Mm-hmm. I'm not denying them, but it doesn't mean that just because, you know, I'm hangry right now that I have to now, you know, let it out on the whole world. Right. So it's, right. it's not denial, but there is guidance. And that guidance comes from allowing ourselves to get something of a picture, knowing who we are. What does it mean to be a Jewish woman? Who was Sarah? Who was our, our matriarchs? Esther. This is, this is our Esther moment right now. Right. Vivi, last question. In moments when you're feeling like really down, what's your go-to? It's a good question. Different times, different things. Some nigunim are always good. Nigunim, nigunim are Hasidic songs. Melodies, yeah. Melodies. Because it, it, it activates a different part of your brain mm-hmm. and it touches your emotions in a different way. So that that will be something that can lift. Um, I have a, a little plaque on, on my dresser. Grandchildren are my best, the only, my only therapy or my best, not my only therapy, right. but grandchildren. Sure. But Baruch Hashem. The best therapy, sure. Yeah, that sure. is true. But you yeah, have to also be sensitive that sometimes in a rough moment, it's not always easy to focus on the blessings. Mm-hmm. And sometimes in a rough moment, you have to, even sit with it a little bit. That that's where the nagunim really come in. Beautiful, beautiful. I think. Thank you so much, Vivi. You gave us Thank so you. much food for thought, and so much to absorb in 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 all that you went through in your in your journey. Hannah, can I add a quick, just a quick one? Okay, of course. Because we spoke about Shlemy, we spoke a little bit about Blumi and a little bit about Rifki. I want to tell you about Mendel for a moment. Before we had the diagnosis, I just saw this baby who was about a year old and he was bright eyed and he was sweet and cute and funny, and but he was tiny. And I wrote a letter to the Rebbe and I got the, the Rebbe answered me with a bracha for Mendel. Zehakat and Gadol Yehiya, the words that are said at the bris, at the circumcision ceremony, and the blessing for the child that this small one will become big. And Mendel lived to 36, which in, in his situation especially was quite remarkable. But I also asked the Rebbe for guidance around that time. I don't remember if it was in the same letter. And the Rebbe answered me, according to Jewish law, which is very liberating because I don't have to think, do I feel like making Shabbos? It's Shabbos. Mm-hmm. Shabbos. Do it. Mm-hmm. Just do it. Kol el bitochen bahashem, including trust in Hashem, v'simcha ba'avidase, enjoy in serving him. So that's something, a lot to talk about. I wanted to say about Mendel. He told one of his brothers, he didn't tell my husband or me, and he had... Of all of them, he had the most challenging life. Rifki had the most challenging physically, but he had the most challenging overall. And he fought every day of his life. And he told one of his brothers that every day I look in the mirror and I say to myself, the Rebbe gave you a bracha. Now go out and make it happen. Mm. Wow. And I think, you know, that idea that we don't just receive brachas, we have to work with brachas. Wow. That's that's, that's a, a life lesson for Mendel. Um, it's a life lesson for all of us, how you took your revealed and unrevealed blessings and you, you made them into blessings. You found the blessings in, in your life. And it's you give us a lot of food to, to think about, a lot of food for thought on how we can apply the blessings, learn and find the blessings in our own lives. And Mashiach should come already, <laughs> make the world normal. We'll have the a normal world. We'll do the work yeah. then too. Exactly. And we want to wish you th- only joy and nachas from all your children and grandchildren and, and yourself. You from, amen. And you from yours. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much you. for joining us. Thank you, Hannah.
Wow, what a truly great person this VB is. Uh, someone who really, you can see she really walks the walk. She believes in what she's saying and she lives it. And she uses those, those means of coping, her faith and her joy, she uses to really live each day to the fullest. What I think I loved the best from this video, from this interview was how Vivi said, at one point I asked her, what about the chances of your children surviving? And do you discuss that with them? And she says, chances? The way she said that, uh, how there is no chance. And it's so true. There is no chances in our world. There is no such thing as coincidence in our world. It's how we see things orchestrated by God and God is running everything that allows us to get through the hardest situations in our lives. And when you can have that attitude of there is no chances and really appreciate that, I think that's something that can help each and every one of us in every situation and every circumstance. I also really loved the part about her uh, when she was explaining about Rifki, how at one point Rifki said that it was just too much for her. It was just too much for her what she was going through and she just felt she couldn't anymore. And instead of just you know preaching to her or telling her anything, Vivi just told her, you've done it. You know, you've done it in the past and I know you have the ability of doing it again. Whatever allowed you to do it in the past, whatever courage you had then, you have that. And I love that moment because she was really giving her the courage to be who she was. She was giving her the support to be who she was. She wasn't preaching to her, telling her, teaching her. She was allowing her to find the, her own strength that she knew she had. And she was saying to her, I believe in you. I believe you have that strength and you have the keys to find your own uh, solutions to the problem. I thought that was really incredible, an incredible part as well as so many others. But those were two key points that really stood out for me. If you enjoy watching these videos, please make sure that you are subscribed to Ordinary People, Extraordinary Stories. You can find us on Chabad.org forward slash Extraordinary. And you can also find us on all plod podcast platforms. So please make sure that you are subscribed to us there. If you like to watch, listen to podcasts, please make sure you look for us, subscribe, like us. We really appreciate it. And as always, we love hearing from you. So if you had any thoughts on this interview, any questions or any comments that you'd like us to share with Vivi or with me, we read every one of them and we love to hear you. We love to hear your thoughts. Thank you again so much for joining us.